here's your host of Shaping Success, Wes Tankersley. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Shaping Success, and welcome to the new set. This is an awesome setup here. If you can do me a favor, if you're watching this on the show, can you please do a watch party? If you're listening to us on the podcast, please do a like, share, and review. Today, our guest is Eric Reinholdt. Eric is an actor, writer, director, and producer, more recently an author, and he recently published his first book. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time to be here. Well, thank you, Wes, for having me. Yeah, hey, it's exciting to get to talk to you. We've we've talked a little bit about your book and here and there, and, right. and now we're going to talk a little bit about, I don't know if you've listened to the show or not, but it's a little bit more about building that blueprint of how you got to writing that book, because I know that there's a whole bunch of other things that you have done as well. Um, can you yeah. tell us just a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get into talking talking about how you got to that point of writing your own book and putting it out there? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a long story. Um, I, I was in the Navy for about six years. In fact, I wanted to retire in the Navy, but I hurt my knee. And uh, back when I was in, in, the, in the 80s, if you couldn't be on a ship, you couldn't be in the Navy. And the operation they wanted to do, the chances of me staying in were pretty slim to none. So I got out and I uh, got my degree in communication, radio and television production, began working in radio in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. I did that for about 10 years, um, got married, um, took a break from radio, and I took a child safety device from my mind to the store shelf. Um, it got knocked off by several companies, and ultimately, I had to um, let go of that company, and I got into TV as a meteorologist, and then after that, my wife left me, and so I had one disappointment after another. No matter how much I poured myself into things, it's like uh, everything just kind of fell apart. The rug was pulled out from under me. Uh, the divorce was the big thing. I just started working as a TV meteorologist on my way up, but I didn't make enough money to afford the child support. And so bottom line is I left everything to get my second degree, and I wanted to become a teacher. And during that time, I started writing the book. Um, it was a catharsis for me to begin with. Um, you know, I, I fought my divorce with the United States Supreme Court, and I felt like nobody was listening to me. And so it was a way that I was able to put my thoughts down on page, but also to escape. You know, it's a science fiction uh, book taking place in the year 2090. They're building a hotel on the moon, things like that. And so it was also a way for me to get away from, from everything that was going on around me and um, pour myself into something that I felt was worthwhile. Um, and I think it is worthwhile. I think the book has a lot of, uh, a lot of lessons in it for people. Uh, I don't want to dominate the conversation. I know you have no, some questions, but I will say this. Yeah, I will say this, that when you read my book and you read conversations between people, oftentimes it's me, the today's me, talking to than me 20 years ago, because I actually wrote this book 20 years ago, and I tried to get a publisher. And, you know, I even took a professional writing course and um, at the University of Texas at San Antonio, and I know you're supposed to send out a query letter. You're not supposed to send your, your uh, first chapter or your manuscript. They don't want to see it. You send a query letter to explain to them why they should want to read it. And I got nothing but rejection from people, rejection, rejection, and they all said the same thing. Unless you know somebody we know, we don't have time for it. And so, you know, after about 30 or 40 of those rejection letters from all these publishers, I finally just gave it up and I started working on other things. I got back into TV as a meteorologist for a while. <clears throat> and then I damaged my right hand pretty severely and I had to have my wrist reconstructed. And so that knocked me out of TV meteorology the second time. And uh, since then, I was struggling just to you know, overcome this thing, because when you damage your right hand and, you, and you're also dominant right hand, it, it really uh, affects your entire world. And so I started going through my, uh, my files again, uh, my old hard drives, and I ran across my manuscript that I'd written 20 years ago. And I thought, you know what? The reason why nobody wanted it is because I didn't know anybody who knew somebody, you know? So I thought, well, you know, Facebook didn't exist back then. 
And I have got like, you know, 1,500 friends or whatever, because I do some movies here and there, and I've got a little bit of popularity, but not a huge amount of following. But I typed in there, I said, do any of my friends know a publisher? And this woman I worked on a film with called Divorce Texas Style with uh, Daniel Baldwin was a star of that one. I, I played uh, uh, Mr. Lynch, who was a, a hotel manager. Anyway, uh, a woman that worked on that film with me said, my, my son's a publisher. And I said, well, okay. You know, and boom, bang, there it is. A year later, I finally got my book published. And so the point is, you know, pour yourself into stuff, even during your down times, when, when, when it seems like nothing is going well and you've got nothing to do, pour yourself into something and do well at it. Make it good because you never know. Maybe the time isn't right just yet. And maybe the door will be opened in the future. And you've done most of the work already. So just keep going. That's the story here. That's, that's, that's the, the message here. Keep going. Don't give up. Yeah, and I really like that. I think that that's a great message to give someone who's thinking about as, you know, I'm trying to write a book right now myself and just thinking of all the things that keep it going and, and being in that moment and continuing to push that and not giving up. Um, let's rewind a little bit because everything that you've talked about so far has been kind of an artistic thing in my mind. You know, you're acting, you're writing, you're directing, you're doing all these things that are really artistic. But when you, when you graduated high school, I'm assuming is when you joined the Navy. It feels to me like that wouldn't be a direction that you wanted to go. Why did you choose the Navy over, you know, going to college right off the bat? Oh, well, I was in a Navy family. My dad retired as a senior chief. Both of his brothers were in. One retired, one did not. Uh, my brother retired as a full commander. Another sister retired as a CW2. Another sister was a lieutenant. I was a second class. I was up for for officer programs too when I hurt my knees. So it was a family thing. Uh, we were a Navy family and it was meant to be, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's an interesting thing because, you know, that's kind of like with, for me, you know, I'm a little bit younger than you, but my parents were always like, Hey, you got to go to college. These are the things you got to do. And we ended up kind of wanting to do the same thing that they were doing. My dad was in, agri in agriculture and my mom, you know, she was, um, she got a degree in education. So I, I choose to push towards the education after I started a manual labor type degree. And so it's interesting that that's kind of, even though it might not have been what you really wanted to do, you just felt like it was the right thing to do. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, it really wasn't much of a decision. I, I just knew I was going to go in the Navy when I graduated high school. I graduated at 17. So I had to get my parents permission and they gave me permission, of course. And I excelled. I had straight 4.0 evals. I was an LPO in charge of a shop only as a second class. And so I excelled. I just hurt my knee. And had I not damaged my knee and not been able to be on a ship anymore, and if I'd have been in the Air Force, I probably could have stayed in. But in the, on the, Navy, in the Navy, on the ship, it was just too much for my knee. And so, um, you know, but, but that was okay because I, I enjoyed working in radio. Um, it, I enjoy working in broadcasting. Um, yeah, it's you, know, you just have another, to make decisions. It's just another canvas, just like we're talking about. And that's what's kind of interesting to me is the fact, like, was there anything that you did in high school? Like, were you in theater? Were you in, like, wanting to be in front of the camera is something that you, like, for me, it wasn't something that I wanted to do. But now I'm like, this is the only thing I want to do. Was that something you had well, passion for before? Not really. You know, um, I will say this, though. There was... Um, uh, career day way back then where we went to various places and we did visit the radio station and they did let me go on the air uh, to introduce a song and I guess that was a little bit of a thrill but that's not really what necessarily took me in that direction um, oh man you know a lot of the decisions that I've made uh, have been me trying to make sense of everything <laughs> And, and that actually worked well for this book because I have a lot of experience in a lot of areas. I was an electronics technician in the Navy. And, you know, I worked on electronics back when things were big. You know, you had a big old circuit board. And then I started getting these little bitty IC chips that would fit in the palm of my hand. And I look at the schematic. I'm going, my goodness, it's this board I've been working on. They've shrunk it down to this little thing in my hand. <laughs> I mean, how do they do that? It boggles my mind still that they can miniaturize all this stuff. But it also gave me a lot to work with in my book because I talk about, you know, 
uh, technology of the future. Um, also, my science degrees. I have a BS in earth science and a master's in environmental science. And so I know some things that are going on. Uh, and I put that in there, but I also know some things that can happen uh, if we don't do something about it. It'll actually wipe us out. And I bring that to people's attention, too, because there are some dangers out there that if the wrong people know about it and do some things, it, it can actually be devastating to us. And so I do believe that these science fiction kind of books that have the plausible kind of scenarios are really important for us to look at because it could actually protect us in the future. Well, let's so, talk a little bit about the book. It's called Time of a Life, right? And what, a trip of, trip of, I, I, trip of a lifetime. I'm sorry, That's a trip okay. of a lifetime. Um, it's a trip of a lifetime, and it's a little bit, you said it's kind of like a little bit autobiographical because it's a lot about your life experiences where you're kind of talking new you's, talking to old new you. So let's, let's hear a little bit about it. Okay, like for instance, uh, the, the new me talking to the old me. Listen, I'll tell you something. I wrote this book uh, with a number of things in it, and one of them, again, was uh, autobiographical, me learning my lessons and trying to help other people not make the same mistakes I made. And there's a good example here where the, um, the hero, uh, Stefan von Rice, is uh, with his girlfriend, Kristen uh, Sheffield, and uh, she is uh, checking out dresses and stuff like that. And um, she's, you know, trying it on, and he sits down next to this other guy, which would have been the younger me, by the way. <laughs> uh, his name is Dick. And, uh, and, and Dick's, you know, his wife comes out, you know, says, what do you think? And he's going... Uh, it looks great, baby. Come on, let's get out of here, okay? Can we go? You know, it's one of those kind of things. Like, let's uh, hurry up. It looks great. Let's go. Whereas Stephen says to him, Stephen says, hey, uh, I think you're looking at this all wrong. You know, I I'll bet you don't even know what size your wife wears. And he goes, yeah, you're right. I don't. You know, but why don't they have regular sizes anyway? What's this double zero thing? You know, why can't they have small, medium, and large? You know, I mean, it's this argument in a way that they're going... Yeah. And, and, and Stephen says, I don't know, you know, that's a good point. But the bottom line is, if you don't know what size she wears, how are you ever going to buy her that as a gift? Right. Don't you see that sometimes if you really pay attention to your wife when she's shopping, she's actually picking out your Christmas present for you if you just <laughs> pay attention. Yeah. yeah, but we don't. I didn't. And so many marriages would, have, would be stronger today if the man would just pay attention to her wife or his wife when she's looking around at this and that and trying things on and, and whatnot. So that's part of it. You know, that's one of the lessons that I try to teach the younger people. So it's interesting because you, this, you said you wrote it 20 years ago. And yeah. you were actually, did you change anything before it got published? Because you shopped oh, around for a while. To. Yeah, okay. So talk about that process. What was it like editing and kind of going back through it and, and making it something a little bit different? Well, you know what? Uh, it's really nice to have a publisher because uh, they know a lot more than you do, and especially if it's your first book. Uh, my initial book was only like 53,000 words, and he told me, he says, now for, for an adult novel, it's got to be at least 70,000. 80,000 words is better. But, you know, uh, that's you don't have enough. Uh, information, enough words in there. And so I worked on that too, but, but not only that, a lot of stuff had happened in those years. Do you know, in my book, I made up the name of a company that was an IT company. And they built this uh, virus. And I'm not going to mention the name of the company right now, but they, they built this virus that was actually um, – meant to uh, infiltrate governments and topple governments. It was a very, very uh, invasive virus. And um, it was an IT company. And lo and behold, when I started looking at this book again a year ago, there's a company by that name that exists now, and they're an IT company. I had to take them out of the book. I had to <laughs> rename the company. I thought they were going to sue me. And that wasn't an all. That wasn't all. There's a restaurant in, 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 in uh, Houston that I, I make up in the book. And in 2015, it exists. So I'm going, how can that be? How weird is that? In my book, you know, they, like I say, they, uh, they're uh, building a hotel on the moon. They're talking about doing that now. Um, 
they talk, you know, the, in the book, they also mine, of course, they mine stuff, and they're talking about that. So a lot of the stuff that they're talking about um, doing today, I actually wrote about 20 years ago. I, I almost wish I would have gotten it published back then, but in a way, you know, the timing probably just wasn't right, and maybe now is the right time to, to get it out there. Well, and I so. think that we all deal with that. You know, we, we sit there and we look at it. And the thing is, is had you just kind of given up like you were talking about, had you decided that, eh, no one will buy it now and never worked at it or looked at it 20 years later, you would have never had that opportunity. So it's it's one of those great stories of, you know, resilience and pushing and continue to going through right. and re, re-engineering it instead of just doing the same thing wrong over and over and over. You knew that you had to adjust what you had written, but it's obviously out there now. So you got it. Right, and I also had to change some other things. Like uh, when, when I went to the publisher, he had me go and, and talk to uh, an editor, and the editor brought it to my attention that I needed to make things a little bit more futuristic than I did, you know, some of the words. And so it really helped a lot to, to have someone to counsel me on those little things. I'm also a scientist, and so I write scientifically. Well, that's not the way you write a novel. You don't write a novel scientifically. So I had to learn how to actually have a different writing uh, strategy or, or, or format or whatever. And that's another thing that the publisher helped me to, to learn. And the so, editor. So. so before you had an editor and a publisher, did anyone else read this besides you? Or was, was it? No, I couldn't get anybody to read it. No, I, nobody wanted to read it. All the people that I sent query letters to basically said, we don't have time for you unless you know somebody. So, no, nobody really read it. Oh, maybe a close friend, and that's it. But, you know, I mean, nobody of any consequence. Yeah. And I just gave up, and I thought, okay, well, it's a nice story. And, you know, I thought, well, there may be something in the future. I don't know. Uh, but, again, I had actually given up on it and ran across it again as I was going through old, old hard drives. And I thought, wow, you know, something's changed since I got uh, uh, turned down about this. And the, the thing that had changed was social media. And there was a new thing that I might be able to employ to give this thing new life, and it worked. That's yeah, all and, I can say. It worked. And that's great because that's kind of where we're at right now. You know, this is obviously a way of pushing it out there for you. Um, you know, I followed your Instagram page this morning, so I know that you have that. And it's just some, it's another avenue to get it out there. And it's kind of the world that we live in now. Um, mm-hmm. what, as far as, you know, what advice would you give someone who is writing a book right now, something that maybe you didn't know 20 years ago that you know now that would be helpful if they're working on that? Well, you know what, and, and, and this is a hard thing to, to, to wrestle with, okay? It really, really is. And I'm sorry if it's just such a mountain that some people maybe not be, may not be able to overcome it, but if, if, if you're writing, you need to make every word mean something and you need to make it interesting because your goal is to get people to read the last page. And if somewhere along the line they lose interest, well, you've lost them. And that's not easy to do. Bottom line is write it, then read through it. And as you read through it, if there's anything in it that starts to lull, that's a, a movie's like that too. You don't want a, a movie to drag. You know, you want to you know, pick it up, you know. So, so you've got to continue to make it interesting, teach people something. People like to learn things, you know. Um, but again, I, I think the main thing would be to focus on just making it interesting. And that's hard, isn't it? Yeah, that is difficult, but it makes complete sense. I mean, that's with anything, you know, we we look at like social media, you can even look at that because, you know, writing a book is a form of media, you want people to be interested in it. And that, I love that you just said that you want people to read the last page, because so many times, people will read the first five or six pages of it, they'll find no interest in it, and then they'll just put it down. If it doesn't grab your attention, then it then they're not going to watch it. And that's the that's the time that we live in. It's, you know, you're looking at Facebook, you're looking at Instagram, and you're just swiping through. TikTok's one of those ones where you you got a 15 second video to make someone want to sit there and watch 15 seconds. I mean, that's where we've got this attention span nowadays. And it's right. if you can either kind of market to that, or you can not sell your product. And so, yeah, that that's a that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up too, because with social media today, 
people, they want uh, tidbits. They want little sound bites, you know, a minute, two minutes at the most. A book is a lot longer than that. And so you really have a chore because – People's attention span is just not as long as it used to be. Now, I worked as a, as a television, not only as a meteorologist, but as a reporter at one point in time. And we always kept our sound bites, you know, 17 seconds, 11 seconds in those packages. Because even then, people had somewhat short attention spans. And you had to, you know, shake them up every now and again and wake them up with something different. Uh, well, it's even gotten worse with social media. People's attention spans have gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. And so these books have really got a got a move, right? So, so yeah. you so the book is out. It's out now, right? In print. Are you going Anywhere, to, everywhere books are sold? Uh huh. Okay. Are you going to do an audio book to it as well? Is that something that you'll? I read? am. I am. Yeah, I am now. Um, I just purchased. I'm giving too much away, probably. But <laughs> you see, I come from radio too. I worked in radio for over a decade. I worked in Dallas radio in the very beginning, and this is way back, you know, in the '80s. And so, um, I want to do a radio drama, and I have a program right now that it uses artificial intelligence. And I'm gonna tell you something, man. <laughs> this artificial intelligence can blow you away because you, you know, there is a little bit of work involved to make it sound normal and stuff. But with a little bit of work, you can do that. And I'll have multiple voices and sound effects and stuff. So, yeah, I do want to make an audio book, but I want it to be more like a radio drama to, to really bring people into the story. Well, and that's one of the, way that, that's one of the ways that people can, you know, that listen to it now. Like, I, I know for me, like, this is my part-time kind of gig here, and I do a day job where I drive around a lot. So I always just throw audio books yeah. on all day long and listen to those as we're going. So it'll be a good way to get it out there even more. So. The book is called The a Trip of a Lifetime. It's out anywhere you can, you can purchase books. Hey, yeah. you know, I want to say thank you for taking the time to be on here. I'm going to make sure that when we get this out, we'll tag you in social media. I'll make sure that you see it. Feel free to All share right. whatever you can, and uh, we'll try and help you get a bunch of more readers for that thing. It's exciting to have you on here. I want to be kind of cognizant of your time. Um, is there anything anywhere else we can find you so that people can, you know, kind of talk with you about any, anything that you have to share with them? Well, you know, I have a, a Facebook page, Trip of a Lifetime, the novel, you know, if you want to try to contact me. There I also have a Facebook page, just Eric Reinhold, senior. Um, that means I have a son who's a junior, by the way. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, those two ways are, are good. Um, yeah, and, and the book is, is everywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, book, Books A Million, um, Roku, or whatever that is with, with Walmart. You know, you can order uh, hardback, paperback, and uh, ebook right now. And again, the, the audio book will come out hopefully this, this year. I'll have it done. Well, that's yeah. great. That's but, awesome to hear and about the that. IMDb. I'm also, on, I'm also on the IMDb, and there may be a way to contact me on the IMDb, the Internet Movie Database, because I've done some film work as, as well. Okay. Well, I'll make sure that I put all that in the show notes so everyone can find you. I know that you also have an Instagram page. Are you very active there? Uh, not as much. Maybe more I'll on, start. <laughs> okay. More on yeah. Facebook, you're saying, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Less. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, we do have one last question before I let you go here, and this is the same Please. question that I ask everyone. It's a little bit different than okay. the show, but the show is called Shaping Success. And so success is different to every single person. And that question that I have for you is, what is the shape of your success? How do you define success? Well, you know, what happened recently with me is a good example of that. You know, I'm not going to mention sort of what it is. But I enjoy having enough to help people. You know, it's one thing to want to help people. It's another thing to have the resources in order to do it. And, and when you are successful to a, to a degree that you can uh, afford to be generous, uh, it just, it's wonderful. And, and to me, that's really what it is. Uh, touching people's lives, touching, you know, saving lives. I love doing television meteorologist. I love the fact that I, I could be saving someone's life, my child safety device. I love the fact that I could be ch saving children's lives. That's really what it's all about, positively impacting other people's lives. That's a great message. I love to hear that because you definitely sound like you want to help other people be successful as well. So I appreciate you taking the time to be on here. 
And maybe we'll have you back on in, a, in about six months here and see how far this has come for you because I'm interested to see how the sales are with the book and how you're getting it out there. So thank you again for taking the time to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Hey, everyone, that's the end of the show. I wanted to say thank you for tuning in. Again, if you're watching this on the live show, please share it. If you're listening to it on the podcast, please like, share, and review it. Help me to grow the show. I can't do it without your help. If you want to have a show like this, go ahead and DM me, contact me. If you want to sponsor the show, same thing. We're here. TVPBN is producing the show, and they do an awesome job. Until next time, I challenge you to find the shape of your success. I am the man behind the curtain. <laughs> Pushing the refresh button. All the screens are live. We're rocking and rolling, baby. With one minute to go. You know, the thing is, is the only people, the only thing they can hear is the echo sound of me in the studio. And you sitting there. But I can hear it all. <laughs> I know. And poor Eric has probably had enough as well. <laughs> This producer is like on something. <laughs> no, that's all good. <laughs> yep. Hey, the good news is, is I didn't eat cat for breakfast. <laughs> Someone told me the other day, because I put this on the end of one of the episodes, that you think you're funnier than you are. <laughs> I, I don't really care if people think I'm funny. <laughs> Hey, every time I make a TikTok, I get five or six hundred views. Oh yeah, <laughs> I do seriously. I get one hundred twenty-eight. Yeah, but today it's all about Wes. Everything's always all about Wes, and you're about to find out all about Wes in six, five, four, three, two, one. Echo. <laughs>